Hey, welcome to Prairie Lakes Church. I'm Cody, I'm one of the pastors here. And the first thing I want you to hear from me today is that we're a no matter church. And what that means is no matter what your past looks like, no matter what you've done, uh, no matter what your history with church looks like, whether you grew up in church or not, uh, we want you to know that God loves you and Prairie Lakes Church is a place that you can look for God. So thanks for joining us. And the other thing I want you to hear from me uh, right away is that connection is a big deal. Uh, we all know that, that God designed us for community. We just, if we're not in relationship with others, we kind of have that void inside of us. We just don't feel quite settled. Um, so connection is a big deal because when we're connecting with other followers of Jesus, we grow in relationship with each other and we grow in relationship with God and we'll take next steps in our walk with Jesus. So if you're ready to take that step today, I'll incentivize you a little bit by saying I'll send you an Amazon gift card if you take the step uh, to get connected here. And all you need to do is text the word NEW to 99581. The next step that we do talk about here every week is giving generously and um, giving generously is a step of obedience if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're an insider here, it's something that we get to do. And uh, one of the things that excites me personally about giving to Prairie Lakes Church is our mission. Um, our mission is to create landing spots where no matter what people can look for God and we don't just want to stay in the spots that we're in. We're in seven physical sites. We want to cover the state of Iowa. So no matter where people are at in the state, they can look for God here with us. So if you want to uh, partner with us in giving to fuel our mission here at Prairie Lakes Church, you can do that online at prairielakes.org forward slash give. But we are going to kick off a series that we've all been looking forward to. Uh, so let's kick to Pastor Jesse. Hey friends, welcome to Prairie Lakes Church. I'm really glad that you're here. It's a great weekend for you to be here. And I know I say that every time. <laughs> I know I do. And I know I'm obviously biased, right? But I, I, I think it's true. And I think it's especially true this weekend because we're starting a brand new series uh, for the next six weeks, walking us through the book of Acts. Um, and so, uh, so it's a great weekend for you to kind of be here. Um, so six weeks. Okay. And, and that's, that's a little bit longer than we, than we normally do, but, but think about this. So week one, we're still in kind of summer. I mean, it feels like summer outside the evenings and mornings are getting a little cooler, but it's still pretty warm by the time we're done. There could be S N O W on the ground. I know, I know. Okay. But we're going to, we're going to watch and experience a season change over the course of this series. And so it's a great, great, great time as kind of the end of the year starts to come more firmly and clearly in view, it's a great time for you to maybe recommit to attending a little bit more regularly. It's a great time for you to jump into a group. This whole series, we've created a bunch of companion resources that are accessible on our website, prayerlakeschurch.org. Great time for you to jump into a group. Um, we've created videos for each of these weekends that you can access there. Pastor Phil, our Grinnell campus pastor, is, is going to be teaching us from week one on that. So anyways, okay, would love, love, love for you um, to join us in this. Now let's get started, okay? Um, before we dive into this specific weekend, let's just do a little bit of an overview of this book, okay? Um, so uh, first thing, who wrote it? Well, a guy named Luke wrote it. And uh, what do we know about Luke? Not a lot, not a lot. Um, what we do know is he was a physician, right? So he was an educated guy. We know he was a Greek, meaning he wasn't a Jewish guy. Didn't really necessarily grow up in church, maybe, you know? And he also, and this is by, probably by far the most important, he was a traveling companion of the apostle and missionary Paul, the guy that wrote like half the New Testament almost, okay? Okay. And so, so he's writing in this book, Acts, which is short, of, short for Acts of the Apostles. He's writing for, about, about like, a, like, a, like a firsthand account because he's traveling and he's watching some of this stuff. But it's Acts is part two of two. Luke also wrote a gospel, uh, one of the first four books in the New Testament. It tells the story of who Jesus is, what he said, what he did. That's a secondhand account because Luke wasn't there for that. But because of his proximity to Paul, 
he's able to kind of gather some of these eyewitnesses accounts and has access to a lot of things. So he writes the story about Jesus and then he writes this book of Acts that talks about what Jesus' closest followers did. Okay? Now, here's some of the things that we know about this. Um, it was written in the first part of Luke and the first part of Acts reaffirm this, uh, part one and two, to, to uh, Theophilus. In fact, it's, uh, Luke says, most excellent Theophilus. Well, who's Theophilus? What do we know about him? Again, not a lot, but there's some. Remember, the Bible, the Bible wasn't written to us. It was written for us, but not to us. We always, we always have to kind of do some digging. Um, so what, what can we infer about Theophilus? Well, you know, first of all, if you just unpack his name, it's a kind of a two-part name. Theo and Phylus, right? Theos is God. Phyllis, phileo, is love. So he's a lover of God or he's a God-fearing person. So we know that. We know that he is a Greek person, right? Because Theophilus is a Greek name. Um, he, we know that because Luke calls him most excellent Theophilus, that's kind of like a title of prominence or preeminence, um, maybe politically, maybe, maybe some kind of important official, you know? So is Theophilus his proper name? Maybe. Um, is Theophilus a code name for someone who's a God-fearing person, but because they're in the Roman government, kind of has to be secret about it? Perhaps. Could it also be like just a, a, a guy that represents a larger group of people, you know, like these Greek people who are kind of rational, kind of educated? Um, could be that as well. Could be all of those. Here's, here's really the whole, the whole summary, okay? Um, Luke the physician, educated guy, you know, rational thinking guy, logical guy. He is writing to 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 a to a educated, non-church growing up crowd. And essentially, what he's saying is this: Hey, we see the world pretty rationally, and I and I know this might sound crazy, but this is what really happened. <laughs> this is what really happened, like. It just gives us, even today, uh, us as the church, kind of our, our, our crazy but true origin story. That's why he's writing it, okay? Um, so over the course of the series, we're going to be kind of just working through the entire book um, this week in just the first two chapters, all right? Um, so, so, so grab your Bibles, turn there with me. We're going to have some of the verses on the screen as well, but let's find Acts together. So New Testament's closer to the back of the Bible than the front. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those first four Gospels. And then you have the book of Acts, okay? Um, and we're going to be just looking in chapters one and two. Skip to the end of verse, or excuse me, chapter two with me. Skip to the end of chapter two with me. And let's just kind of read this together, starting in Acts 2, verse 42, okay? Here's what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And then every day they can continue to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Okay? So that's Acts 2, 42 through 47. If you're um, at all familiar with the Bible, you've probably kind of heard that before. It's this, this, this amazing picture of the, the earliest church and... It's not normal, <laughs> right? Normal people don't operate that way. Um, e e even good people, okay? Even good Christian people, even good Christian church-going people. <laughs> These, most people don't live like that, okay? Just look, look at that list again. Four things. The earliest Christians were, were daily devoted to these four practices, daily devoted Teaching. They were listening to someone teach what Jesus taught every day. <laughs> they, they, they were devoted to fellowship every day, right? Building close relationships and, and meeting one another's needs every day. Uh, they were devoted to eating together, okay? Uh, which, which, which really probably involved communion, the Lord's Supper, but also just kind of normal meals together. And then prayer, okay? Four things every single day. But I don't think that's normal. 
I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's not, you don't really see that a whole lot. And so if you're taking notes, just go ahead and write, write this down. Okay. We're, we're, we're going to have kind of three things we're going to walk back through. And the, and the last one of them is where we're starting. It's, it's uncommon daily devotion. That was an outcome. Okay. That's what they were doing. They were, they were expressing, living out this uncommon daily devotion uh, together, listening to teaching together praying together, knowing one another well enough to serve one another well, together sharing the Lord's uh, supper and normal suppers, right? Um, And they were doing this like every, it says it daily. Now, I don't know, um, I don't know what you you think about that, okay? And I, I don't know, even... I couldn't predict how you feel about that either. And, and, and honestly, I don't want to assume um, because I don't think it's safe to assume, you know? Uh, I, I don't think it's safe to assume that we all look at a life like that and go like, oh man, that's what I want. I don't think that's safe to assume. Um, I don't think it's safe to assume that all of us just want a, a life of uncommon devotion, right? I, 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 I don't. Now, I think it's safer to assume that we all want a happier life, right? I think that's pretty safe, you know? I've never talked to someone and said, would you like to be more happy or less happy? And they go like, you know what, less. I'm too happy right now, you know? Um, I, I think it's safe to assume they all, we all want a life of like more freedom, uh, more time off, maybe a better work-life balance, um, better salary, better house, better car, better vacations, you know? More opportunities for advancement maybe, um, less of what I'm not passionate about, more of what I am passionate about. I want to, I want to contribute in a more meaningful way. I mean, I think all of those are like a lot safer assumptions. And, 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 and frankly, all of those, like, I, I want all those too, right? I'm like, oh, they're fine. They're fine. Those are fine things. But a life of uncommon devotion. <laughs> I mean, listening to sermons every day, every day. Ugh, you know, <laughs> uh, selling my stuff, um, having people all up in my business, you know, eating my food, you know. <laughs> Listen, can we just hit pause here and stop and, and maybe maybe just admit something to ourselves, okay? Um, and, and perhaps even be confronted by something together. Can we just admit that the most updated version of the American dream, which is what all those things are, you know? Can can we just admit that what this American dream continues to evolve into or push towards, can we just admit that whatever that is just seems to look less and less like the church? Can we just admit that? Can Can we admit there's like a growing divergence or a gap? Just don't get defensive on me <laughs> yet. <laughs> but just just consider just for a second whether or not this is true of you, okay? Consider this. I think I think many of us chase after happiness. However we're defining it, many of us are chasing after that. And then what we try to do is we, we try to fit our spiritual lives into that. Okay? Because we know spirit, a good spiritual life is, 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 is maybe a part of, of a happy life. But the more we chase after happy, the less room there seems to be for spiritual. Can we just, I mean, just consider that. Is that true of you? Do, the more you chase after happy, does it feel like the less room there is for spiritual? Things like church, things like fellowship, things like prayer, things like teaching, things like giving, you know? I mean, do these things increasingly feel like they're either add-ons or maybe maybe they even compete with what you feel is most important for your happiness? Are they even maybe threatening your happiness? I mean, 
some of us, I'm sure, are carrying this latent guilt about, ah, I really should go to church more, or I really should start giving, or I, 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 I wish I'd read my Bible more, you know. But I think more of us are resolving that guilt if we're feeling it. We're resolving it by just moving away from all of that and just, just more towards life on my own terms. In fact, when I'm, uh, when I'm out in the wild <laughs> and, uh, and, and maybe I'm traveling and someone asks me, you know, on the plane, hey, what do you do? And I tell them I'm a pastor. Or maybe, maybe even just meeting someone that kind of, kind of goes to Prairie Lakes or kind of doesn't or whatever, right? Well, either way, when I'm out in the wild like that and they learn that I'm a pastor or they realize I'm a pastor, um, there's two responses and it's very predictable, okay? One is, I'm sorry for swearing. <laughs> it's always that. They've used the F word and they're sorry, you know, like I've never heard it before. Um, and then number two is, is always this, man, I really should go to church more. I mean, it's like all of a sudden I'm a pastor. So we're, therefore we're in a confessional, but that's what's there. That's usually what's kind of bang, banging around in their mind and, and heart. And, and, and honestly, some of us, uh, we've moved beyond that and, and we're not, we're not dealing with that guilt anymore because we've convinced ourselves that, you know what, it's fine. Because why? Because following Jesus isn't about the rules, right? It's not about the rules. It's not about going to church, you know, uh, it's not even about reading the Bible or even prayer. What is it? Well, it's like your personal relationship and it's like what you believe, you know? Listen to me. If the very first Christians would have heard us say that to them, they would have looked at us like we were nuts for saying that. And I don't mean they would have looked at us with condemnation and, and you know, righteous, you know, indignation, right? No, 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 not condemnation. I think they would be genuinely confused. Because our personal relationship with Jesus in a corresponding life we were living would look nothing like their personal relationship with Jesus and the corresponding life that they were discovering. Which all of that, I think, and I hope, should cause us to ask a very <laughs> uncomfortable but important question. And that is this. What happened to them that might not be happening to us what what happened to them that's that might not be happening to us right not 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 who's right or who's wrong or or who's more spiritual or who's less spiritual you know I'm like no no I, what happened why is it that their relationship with Jesus just looks way more like a life of uncommon devotion than mine does why does mine all, so often get boiled down to like maybe church attendance if I feel like it and sometimes I just don't feel like it and that's kind of it, you know? What happened to them that, that, that maybe isn't happening to us? Well, Luke is actually really, really clear about what happened to them and he, and he even foreshadows it in the first few verses of chapter one. So, so, so now go back with me just to chapter one, verse one, okay? And then we're just going to read the first part of this chapter together. He says, in my former book, Theophilus, so that's the gospel of Luke, same guy, same audience, but because in my former book, I wrote all about that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to, to these apostles and he gave many convincing proofs he was alive. And he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and he, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John the Baptist, John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, or, 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 at this time, are you going to restore Israel? Like, are we going to become a, a powerful nation again? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times of the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but if you're talking about power, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, the city that they're in, in Judea, the region that they're in, in Samaria, their neighbors next door who really didn't know, and then to the ends of the earth. 
See, in the first two chapters of Acts, after these verses, we're going to see several stories of what happened to these people. Only what we're going to see is it's not a what happened, it's who. See, the Holy Spirit happens to these people. Holy Spirit happens. That's who happens, okay? The Holy Spirit came and he moved in these Christians' hearts. He moved them to crave more of Jesus' teaching. He moved them to rearrange their schedules and gather together. He moved them to want to know one another more deeply. He moved them to want to sell their stuff so that everybody had what they needed. The Spirit moves them to pray. Another one of these um, considerations, okay? Consider this. I think, and this is my experience too, many of us, I think we try and fix our spiritual lives by our own efforts, you know? You know, maybe, maybe, maybe like, uh, I'm going to recommit. I'm going to do this right now, you know? Or maybe if, maybe if you grew up in church, you grew up Catholic or whatever, right? We, we do these little acts of penance, you know? Like, how can I demonstrate that I'm sorry and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be different, you know? I think we do that. But if you feel like you're spinning round and around, it might be because you're trying to do something only the Holy Spirit can do for you. If you feel like you're spinning, if you feel you're, you're, you're constantly trying to fix yourself, you know, you're, you're constantly trying to change your desires. You're, you, maybe, maybe you feel like you're, you're spending most of your life in this spiritual garage, so to speak, just working on stuff and it always breaks down and you're always trying to go back in and, figure out what the problem is and, you know. It might be because you're trying to do something that you you really can't do that only the Holy Spirit can do for you. Go back to Acts with me here, okay? Because in in chapter one, we get these these 11 apostles of Jesus and and, and soon there's going to be 12 again because Judas... Has, has taken his own life as a result of, of feeling guilt about betraying Jesus. And so they name uh, Matthias as a replacement for him. And, and after they do that, beginning in chapter 2, verse 1, read, read with me, okay? When the day of Pentecost came, th- they were all together in one place, all 12 of them. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came down to rest on each of them and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So what we're going to do now is we're going to practice speaking in tongues. No, just kidding. All right. Um, if. <laughs> shouldn't have made that joke. If uh, you grew up in a church tradition that followed a lectionary of some kind, you know, like, like prescribed readings and worship, on the weekends that corresponded with the Christian calendar and holidays and seasons and stuff like that. If you grew up in a tradition like that, you probably remember that you celebrated the Pentecost and you usually celebrated it like early June, you know? Um, And and maybe you even remember the Pentecost, uh, like the meaning of it. It commemorates the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? It's actually quite a bit, quite a bit deeper than that. Um, Pentecost is, it's actually originally a, a Jewish holiday and it's called the Festival of Weeks, okay? And you can see it in, in, in Leviticus. Um, but what this holiday was historically was it commemorated God's provision as the wheat harvest began. It was an annual celebration that God instituted. Remember, I'm providing for you and then he would do it when they would start to harvest the wheat. Now, it occurred 50 days after the Passover, which is why it's called Pentecost, right? Seven weeks plus one day after the Passover. Fifty. Five. Penta. That makes sense? You know? And then as they celebrated over the years, the rabbinic tradition, the Jewish kind of law experts, 
they also associated this provisional holiday with the provision of the Torah, of God's giving of the law to, to Moses, right? Uh, uh, God's, God gives us wheat, he gives us grain, he gives us food to eat, and he's given us the law to live by. In fact, in, in, in Acts 2, right after we get the story of the Spirit coming down on these 12 apostles, here's what we see in verse 5. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven because they were all there for the festival of weeks. They were all there to celebrate this Pentecost. They were there to remember God's provision, not only of life-giving crops, but his way of life. And they were there to rededicate themselves to it, right? To, 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 to get in their spiritual garage once again and start tinkering around and, 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 and redoubling their efforts and, and recommitting and, and going, yeah, God, I, I screwed it up last year, but I'm, I'm going to try harder again this year. <laughs> and on this day, when God-fearing Jews from all over the world descended on Jerusalem to, to recommit themselves once again to this cycle, of living according to God's law and failing and trying again and failing and trying again and failing and offering sacrifices again and again and again. On that day, God says, enough. He says, today's the day. <laughs> today's the day that you no longer just try your best. Today is the day that you stop your striving. Today is the day that you get off the spiritual hamster wheel of spinning and trying to fix and, and failing and rededicating it all over and over and over again. From this point forward, God says on this day, you're going to have my spirit in you and I'm going to move you. I'm going to move you and I'm going to change you in ways that you could never have changed yourself. I'm going to bring about this uncommon devotion that even you at your best could never attain, much less sustain. And in one day, in one day, what the prophet Ezekiel foretold centuries earlier, in one day, God fulfills this prophecy, which now we might have a much better understanding of. Because here's what the prophet Ezekiel foretold in, in Ezekiel 36. He says, and he's speaking, again, prophets speak God's words. So this is God speaking to his people. I will take you out of the nations and I will gather you from all the countries and I'll bring you back into your own land. I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. And then, then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful, and I will not bring famine upon you. I'll increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field. There's the provision. So that you'll no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you'll remember your evil ways and your wicked deeds, and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. And that might kind of sit funny with you. That's a great thing. If you Could you imagine if you had a stronger desire for the good things, which meant you had a stronger disdain naturally for the things you know are bad. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> that's the kind of loathing that's life-giving. When God moves in you. Just, just note this from the path. There's, it's God saying, I will, I will. Here, like, like I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you. I will sprinkle. I will cleanse. I'll give you a new heart. I'll remove from you this heart of stone and I will put my spirit in you. I will, God will, God will, I will, I will. This is something that only God can do for you and for me. So, just remember, here's where we've been, okay? There was this uncommon daily devotion. This uncommon daily devotion, right? But what happened? Well, the Holy Spirit happened to them. 
the earliest Christians they had this uncommon daily devotion, but it wasn't it wasn't just because they were somehow just better than us or just more disciplined or or whatever. No. They were not the cause of their uncommon devotion. We can't go back and just try to do what they did. No, right? The Holy Spirit was the cause. God God moved in them through the giving of his Holy Spirit and he inspired this uncommon devotion in them. The Spirit happened to these people. And unless the Spirit happens, good luck in chasing a life of uncommon devotion. Let me know how it goes for you. In fact, I can probably tell you from personal experience how that's going to go. But this leaves us Right, with one last remaining question. How does the Spirit happen to us? If my life is falling, sometimes <laughs> woefully short of uncommon devotion, and what you're trying to imply is maybe, maybe the Spirit's not happening to me. How does the Spirit happen to me? Take a look at how it happened to 3,000 people this day. Acts 2.22. This is Peter, one of the apostles speaking, and he says this. After people were just amazed at them speaking in different languages, he says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles. God proved that Jesus was who he said he was. Wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man, Jesus, he was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep his hold on him. Therefore, Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. He has made him both Lord, King of the universe, and the Messiah. The one that he anointed to save us. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the apostles, brothers, what should we do? Might as well be. And they didn't know they were asking this, but how do I receive the Holy Spirit? Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every single one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and then receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The, this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. How does the Spirit happen to us so that he can move us into a life of uncommon devotion. How does the Spirit happen to you? It's when you repent. The only way you begin to want this kind of life of uncommon devotion, the only way for the Holy Spirit to come into your life is for you to repent. And if you need to know more about that, or if you feel like you've already done it and, and, and so on and so forth, if you're confused, I need you to pay special attention to this next part because your weekend host is going to walk you through what that probably needs to look like in your life. And let me pray for you and for them as they do. Father in heaven, I do. I pray that we would this weekend see your Holy Spirit descend on our lives. God, as we repent of the things that are standing in the way. Repent of this, these places of darkness in our life. Repent of these directions that we're going that are very contrary to you. And that as we do, as we walk into the light, Jesus, that your light and your Holy Spirit would, would shine in our hearts and free us and produce a life that looks a little bit more like yours. So Jesus, I pray all this in your name. Amen. Thanks for that message, Pastor Jesse. And um, Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew gives us a story that really illustrates what repentance is. So if you would, uh, just turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew uh, chapter 21. And if you just read along with me, it reads, What do you think? There's a man who had two sons. He went to the first and he said, Son, go on and work in the vineyard. 
today. I will not, he said, but later he changed his mind and he went. Then the father went out to the other son and said the same thing, and he answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe in him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So in this story, one of the sons uh, repents and the other one does not. One of them is obedient, the other is not. One of them obeyed with their words, but not with their actions. And the other um, started by disobeying with their words, but later changed his mind and he changed his direction. And that's what repentance is. Repentance is changing your mind and then changing your course, your direction. And maybe uh, you haven't felt the Holy Spirit working in your life the way that Jesse was talking about uh, in his message from Acts today. And maybe that's because uh, you need to take that step of repentance. You need to change your mind. You need to change your actions. And there's a couple ways uh, that you might need to do that. Maybe there's a prominent sin or struggle in your life that you need to change your mind on. You need to turn away from. Or maybe uh, you need a group of people uh, that just know you better, that know your story and your struggles, that are there to encourage you and help you uh, live that life of repentance. And uh, I personally think we all need that. I know I need that. Uh, and the best way for that is uh, in a small group environment. So if you're not in a group, maybe your step of repentance today is to stop living life alone and to do it uh, together in community. And you can sign up for a group right now. We've got a group for you this fall. All you need to do right now is text GROUP to 99581 and we'll help you get plugged into a community of people that you can walk with, that you can do life with, that they can help you live that life of repentance with. So uh, just encourage you to take that step. Uh, don't waste this time. Spend some time with God today to just figure out what your step needs to be. But if you need prayer or you just want to talk with someone about the message today or something going on in your life, uh, hit the life prayer button if you're on church online and I would love to connect with you. And kids, uh, you are up next. Children's ministry is going to start in just 60 seconds and everyone else will see you back next week.
and change and it starts so with me. One hand high. Welcome to Story Lab. This week we're taking a look at the very brightest light of all time. Hey, Z, uh, have you? Shh, you're gonna need this. What? Uh, why? Oh, oh. oh, that's why. Hey, I'm Zeke. And I'm Carter. And all month, we're talking about how trusting and following Jesus changes the way we treat others. Thanks for treating me to these shades. By the way, want to explain? Well, it's been rainy and overcast where we are for about a decade now. Just 12 days. Long days. Monsoon season. How much more rain can there be? Another week? Oh. Yeah, it's got me down to. Well, it's time to take matters into our own hands. Behold! Yeah, we can see a lamp. Not just a lamp. This is a 10,000 lux sun lamp. Oh, I got you now. Friends, do not look directly at a sun lamp. Keep it to one side like this. Wise words. No matter how dark things get, 30 minutes in front of this sweet model can trigger the release of serotonin in your brain, just like real sunlight. Serotonin is a chemical in your body that helps you feel happy. It can make you more focused, emotionally stable, and calmer. Thank you, cheerful disembodied voice. Extra happy to help. <laughs> See, the lamp is working for everyone. We might as well do something with all this awesome sunlight. Like what? Suncatcher? <laughs> Suncatcher? I'm in. Let's make it! We shall now capture and distill the very essence of the sun into this ordinary bottle. Uh, that's not what we're doing. Oh. Step one. Gather all your old, used up, broken up crayons. So many memories. Yes. Make sure to remove any paper that's left, and then you're going to shred those crayons. You got to think bigger, my friend. Oh, that'll work too. What next? Step two, lay down a sheet of parchment paper. Here you are, Z. Thank you. Now, sprinkle a layer of crayon shavings all over your parchment. Next, layer a second sheet of parchment on the top. You'll want to tape it down. On it. Step three, you'll need a hairdryer because things are about to heat up in here. It's time to melt those crayons. Uh, 
All right, what's the next step? All right, step four. Take your sheet of melted crayons and cut out shapes. You can do one big shape or you can do lots of little shapes. Use your imagination. And done. Great. All you got to do now is hang up your sun catchers with string and clear tape. Oh, <laughs> very cool. You're using a shower of raindrops to catch some rays. A little light can make all the difference. Speaking of light, it's time for... The Story Before the Story. Today, we're in the book of John one of the four Gospels that tells about the life of Jesus. John was one of Jesus' closest friends, right in the middle of everything. John wrote down what he saw and heard to help us understand who Jesus truly is. The Son of God. John recorded these stories in a really cool way. He shared about several signs or miracles that Jesus did. And John also wrote down specific things that Jesus said about himself what we call the I am phrases. Which is where our story starts. Take it away. Hey everyone, I'm Brian. Today we're going to dive into something incredible that Jesus said. But first, we're gonna go back to an earlier time. See, John didn't start his story of Jesus with the manger and shepherds and angels. John began with the very beginning. John wrote that God created everything in the whole universe through Jesus. From before the dawn of time, Jesus has been the source of all life and light. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome the light. Ah, light shows up throughout God's story. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born as a baby, Isaiah wrote of a bright light to come. The people who are now living in darkness will see a great light. They are now living in a very dark land, but a light will shine on them. And when Jesus was born, God's people were still waiting for that light. Many of them expected a splendid king who would defeat their enemies in a blaze of glory. But Jesus arrived as a tiny baby. He grew up as a humble carpenter. As Jesus began to travel, and teach, he started to shine God's light in a very different way. In John, we read how Jesus turned water into the very best wine so a wedding celebration could continue. He spent time with people who were considered outcasts and showed them God's love. Jesus healed a man who had been sick and unable to walk for 38 years. Jesus fed more than 5,000 people using just five loaves of bread and two small fish. He even walked on water. Mm -hmm. All of these signs began to paint a picture of who Jesus is. Anytime that Jesus saw a need, he did something about it. But the religious leaders weren't happy with Jesus. He was changing the way they'd always done things. And he didn't back down when they challenged him. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness. They will have that light. They will have life. I am the light of the world. Jesus was telling the religious leaders and everybody else that he is God's rescuer, sent to bring light to a dark world. So what does it mean for us that Jesus is the light of the world? Well, when it's dark, yikes! You don't know which way to go. It's confusing. You might bump into a wall or walk right over the edge of a cliff. We need light so we can see the path ahead and know where to go. Jesus brings light to guide us in the right direction. We need Jesus to help us make wise choices. The light that Jesus brings can also help us grow. Just like a plant needs light to thrive, we need God's light to show the places where we can grow to become more like Jesus. But even more than guiding us and helping us grow, the light of Jesus meets our greatest need. See, we've all done wrong things that hurt others and break our relationship with God. This is called sin and we can't fix it on our own. 
it's like living in the dark. But Jesus came to take the consequences of our sin and bring us back to relationship with God. When we turn away from the wrong things we've done and choose to follow Jesus, it's as if he shines a bright light into our hearts and our lives. As Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness. They will have that light. They will have life. And that is a V M. Jesus is the light of the world. What a cool word picture. Dare I say this has been a light bulb moment? For real. There's nothing so dark that Jesus can't bring light to it. So, what's our part in the story? Well, we all need light in our lives. Every single one of us has done wrong things that hurt others and break our relationship with God. And we can't fix that. But God saw our need and sent Jesus to be light in our darkness. When we choose to follow Jesus, we can live with God forever. It's the most amazing show of compassion ever. And compassion is caring enough to do something about someone else's needs. God met our greatest need, and we don't just need the light of Jesus one time. We need it over and over every day of our lives. When you face a tough decision and don't know which way to go, you can ask Jesus for wisdom. To shed a little light on things. You can also ask God to show you where you need to change to become more like Jesus. Like growing in kindness or patience. I could use a little light in those places for sure. I think we all can. See you next time. So, here's the thing. Jesus is the light of the world. Even when it's been raining for 12 days Especially straight. Especially when it's been raining for 12 days straight. Ready? Ready. Hit it. Thanks for joining us in the Story Lab. See you next time.